Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today. Potentially good news for Republicans in the third one, but we'll uh, we'll hash that out. Uh, Jim, let's start with uh, the good news. It was a, a pretty effective day for clearing miscreants uh, out of illegal positions on campuses yesterday. We had the the last vestiges of uh, Columbia and then uh, UCLA. It looked like it was escalating big time, and it was, and that's probably why the authorities came in, uh, including the California Highway Patrol. Hat tip to you for uh, the Ponch and John reference <laughs> today on Twitter. I'm sure they rode their motorcycles in there and cleared it out very effectively. Yesterday, there was uh, some snickering going on about the uh, the needs that the Palestine solidarity protesters uh, wanted, including headlamps and gas masks and knee and elbow pads, super bright flashlights with strobes. And then, of course, uh, they had certain foods that they absolutely could not tolerate, including coffee, bagels, of course, because we can't have that. No bananas. No nuts. Well, that would mean they'd all have to evacuate. Eventually, UCLA officials got tired of the the belligerents. One of the most famous uh, buildings on campus was basically ransacked because that's all the lefties know how to do. One of the comments yesterday, I don't know if it rises to the level of the basic humanitarian aid from the girl at Columbia, but uh, the girl yesterday at uh, UCLA talking about how the entire UC system is uh, a part of a colonial system on stolen land. So, Lesson to you, righties and lefties, no matter how much you give them, they'll always want more. But uh, in the end, Jim, the polling numbers must be looking really, really bad for the left because they've uh, run out of patience all pretty much at the same time. Looks like the same thing's uh, happening at George Washington University in the nation's capital as well. So that's good. Greg, we talked a bit about, bit about this earlier in the week, the argument that, yeah, maybe there's some sort of you know Republican advantage and that this was going to make Biden look incompetent. We'll talk a bit about more about that in our second martini. But I'd rather have order and law and non-harassment of students, uh, Jewish students on campus, sooner rather than later. So I'm glad that this has occurred. Good job, Ponch and John. Um, I would point out, when you see that statement from the protesters who said the ultimate goal was to destroy the University of California system. Greg, have we act, have we have we judged them too harshly? No. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. You want to destroy the entire UC system? Keep talking. Let's see where this conversation goes. I maybe there's some common ground. And speaking of common ground, I think the most inspiring uh, sight uh, or 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 sound of yesterday was on one of the college campuses where apparently the pro-Palestinian, some would argue pro-Hamas, anti-Israel students started chanting, let's go Brandon, you know, blank Joe Biden. But the irony is that these pro-Israeli counter-protesters also believe that Joe Biden is doing a terrible job on this. So they too started uh, chanting blank Joe Biden. So in a way, like I, I'm hoping you just kind of like all of a sudden saw them look at each other and say, hey, we don't disagree on, on so much after all. And they embraced and they all kind of came together and sang Kumbaya. And everybody agreed Joe Biden's doing a terrible job at this. Um, no, but somebody seriously, there is, I think, a useful and I think an important lesson for university administrators, because this is not the last time we're going to see a bunch of leftist, Marxist, crazy students trying to, you know, shut down the campus, camp out, take over buildings, stuff like that. Protest is part of the culture at, uh, at these universities. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with protest. That is part of the First Amendment. Universities do have rules and regulations. You know, you can't obstruct other students from going to class. You can't, you know, there's certain uh, hopefully content neutral, you know, restrictions on when and where you can protest. And if you start breaking the law, I, there's been this argument of like, oh, well, you can't do that. You know, it's a college campus. No, no, you break the law. Cops can respond anywhere, particularly if there's a threat of violence. And I think the lesson of these past couple of weeks is that as I understand the mentality of, well, they haven't done anything too bad yet, or ah, this is technically violating campus rules, but we're going to give them more time to negotiate. If you don't nip it in the bud, there is always that chance that it gets much, much worse. And then you end up with your campus looking like a war zone, like it did at UCLA yesterday. So like there is an argument to be said, you got to draw a firm line. I think as we discussed earlier in the week, University of Florida uh, and a couple others have this very, 
lay out the rules, make them very clear, say what you're, it's okay form of protest, what's not an okay form of protest. Anything that represents a physical assault on students or someone is, uh, is not acceptable. And when that happens, bring in the cops. This is not a matter of, you know, some administrator wanging a finger. I mean, you can expel them and you should expel them. Um, but the other, this is not, this is a matter for the law and they should be the ones who adjudicate and deal with it when someone is accused of assault and things like that. So better late than never. Glad to see it. Uh, you can make an argument that should have happened, you know, quite some time ago. The internal polling must've been pretty lousy because I, I, I don't think this all got shut down in 24 hours across the country on coincidence. You do wonder what changed and was this some, you know, like were there communications? Was there a general sense that this was going to be a... Uh, continuing issue for the Democrats, a sense that, you know, uh, you know, Joe Biden can't keep control over the country. Things are spinning out of control. I mean, again, maybe foreshadowing our second martini here, but um, it's just very weird that, you know, maybe just the graduation's coming up and they need to get this thing wrapped up before they, you know, before it turned into an issue for the graduation ceremonies. And hopefully now that things have calmed down in several places, USC might reconsider, but uh, maybe they won't about their commencement ceremony. But Jim, it just, it just strikes me uh, these radicals took over the academic building at Columbia, ransacked it, destroyed a bunch of furniture. We saw the same thing at UCLA. We saw what happened at Occupy Wall Street and the just whole devolution of human behavior there with multiple sexual assaults and defecating on police cars. We saw what happened in the uh, once the Antifa and, and some elements of the BLM crowd took over in the George Floyd protest. There was just burning and looting and mayhem all over the place. And Mrs. Corumbus, who is a avid listener to the Three Martini Lunch for multiple reasons, says, this reminded me of a uh, Ray Bradbury quote in Fahrenheit 451, those who don't build must burn. It's kind of a twist on the old Batman uh, line from Alfred, too, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's true. The, the left doesn't build, it destroys. Greg, I'm just very glad to note that 50% of the wives of this program are avid listeners. <laughs> Were Mrs. Garrity to listen? No. Um, <laughs> look, yeah, like I, I really do. In a better country, the events of the past few weeks would spur a deeper conversation on campus, in which these all these campus administrators would ask, "What is the purpose of this?" Because yes, we have this tradition of protest, particularly going back to the late '60s. But what, what is our job? What is the thing we're supposed to do? And we're supposed to educate the students. And that also means you, the student, your job there is to absorb knowledge. Your job is to have more knowledge going. You are not supposed to spout knowledge because I got some news for a bunch of you from, you know, 18 to 22. I know you think you know everything. Because when I was 18 to 22, I thought I knew everything. And guess what? I didn't, right? Turns out the world is not as simple as you think it is. When you're 18 to 22 or whatever those ages are. Oh, by the way, a whole bunch of them are, you know, like, you know, graduate students and considerably older than that. They should have a little more uh, life experience under their belt. They should have a better understanding of all this. Why can't we just stand out? You know, like, by the way, divestment from Israel, the small six-figure sums on the multi-billion dollar uh, endowments you have, that's not going to bring the Israeli economy crashing down and force them to the negotiating table with Hamas. It's not going to work. Go back to math class, for starters. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Fast Growing Trees. Did you know that Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the United States with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and more than 2 million happy customers? They have everything you could possibly want in this planting season, like fruit trees, palm trees, evergreens, houseplants, and so much more. Whatever you're interested in, they have it for you. You can find the perfect fit for your climate and space. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online, and your plants will be shipped directly to your door in just one or two days. And along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever. We really love our fast-growing trees, our plants, our herbs, the oregano going in the lentil soup, and of course the plants that we actually don't eat, like the fig and the monstera and so forth. But this spring, fast-growing trees has the biggest deals online, up to half off on select plants and other deals. And listeners to the Three Martini Lunch get an additional 15% off their first purchase when using the code martini at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using the code martini at checkout. FastGrowingTrees.com, code Martini. Offer is valid for a limited time. Terms and conditions may apply. All right, Jim, on to our second Martini, our bad Martini, or maybe another better late than never, but it really should have come earlier <laughs> Martini. Uh, now that things have uh, pretty much wound down at Columbia and UCLA, and they seem to be winding down to some extent at George Washington, now... 
now is when President Biden has decided that uh, we must uphold the rule of law while also protecting the freedom of speech. So in a very brief statement that was interrupted by a number of throat clearings and hacks, uh, here is uh, President Biden saying what uh, free speech does not include. Violent protest is not protected. Peaceful protest is. It's against the law when violence occurs. Destroying property is not a peaceful protest. It's against the law. Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is a peaceful protest. Jim, he's right about that. But where was this a week, two weeks, whenever this all started uh, and before mayhem was forcing every class online at Columbia and USC was canceling graduations and a whole lot of other uh, chaos was unfolding. Listeners, before I go any further, I should clarify when Greg says that the uh, Biden's remarks were interrupted by coughs and hacks, he, he means a cold, not Biden staffers. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, like, like there's nothing wrong with what Biden is saying here. Uh, reading off a teleprompter right. in prepared, prepared remarks, fine. You know, we've, we've gotten very used to it. I noticed that the, the other time Biden addressed this a little bit more than a week ago, we got appropriate written issued statements from the White House press office on behalf of Biden saying harassment of Jewish students is bad. OK, great. And then when, you know, there was a called out question to Biden, we got the, ah, I disagree with that. And also I disagree with people who don't understand how much the palace, you know, and, and he gets cut off. But it was this very quick moral equivalence. And a lot of people have said this was the, you know, Biden version of very fine people on both sides. Now, Biden at any point could go in front of the cameras and say whatever he wants. And so if he really was bothered by this, he could do so. He didn't. He doesn't do a lot of these. Uh, he certainly doesn't hold formal press conferences anymore. He doesn't do sit-down interviews very much. Or if he does, he does it with Howard Stern or the guys from Smartless. And, you know, I think Sean Hayes is going to ask those really tough questions. There was this contradiction between the written statements that are written, you know, written by somebody else. I assume Biden looks these things over before they're put out in his name. But I don't know that. Maybe. We, we have Maybe. No, no guarantee of that. And uh, so, it, look... I'm glad he did this. I can't help but notice, like, the, the, the camps just got cleared out. Like, like where, where you been, man? It's been, you know, ra- chaos on ca- campuses for, like, two or three weeks now. And, oh, oh, now that it's resolved, Biden comes out and says, you know, we got to respect the First Amendment and we got to enforce. Oh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. You know, now, here's the great irony. Imagine if Biden had made these remarks a week ago. Imagine if Biden had made these remarks two weeks ago. One, besides, I think these would have a great much carry more weight if Biden had done this. And the universities did that. Biden might actually look like a leader, like, like his remarks had spurred these university administrators and local officials to say, all right, that's it. We got, you know, he declared something intolerable. University leaders followed up and made it, you know, made it stop. That would look like leadership. As is, he looks like he's saying, you know, it's, you know, it just stopped raining and Biden comes out and calls for sunshine. You know, like it's it's this you know cause effect backwards sort of thing, and I just you know it's not like we expect much better from Biden, but it, you know opposing the guy, I just feel like he's very badly served by the people around him. Um, it, you know, we we joked earlier in the week about Karine Jean Pierre when asked about bird flu, says, "Well, I don't eat meat." Great, thank you. That's very helpful. You know, like. <laughs> At some point, you just would like, you know, like this, this is our president. It would be nice if there were people, good, smart people who could advise the president and that he wasn't always a day late and a dollar short. And he didn't always look like this tired, confused old man who always shows up after the story's done and gives us the most basic anodyne, you know, generic comments possible about an ongoing controversy that is, you know, when he spent the last couple weekends over at his, you know, Delaware Beach House. He is poorly served, but it's his own fault because he ended Wait, up you should blame the guy nominating these people, appointing all those people. And he basically got shoved or he thought it was a good idea to put radicals in a lot of these positions. And these people are pushing him to pander to the absolute fringe activists on all these number of issues where you could have followed the... Nixonian strategy of realizing the American people don't agree with the insane people on campus talking to the silent majority or whatever you want to call them these days. But uh, uh, he's going to struggle as a result of this. Will it cost him the election? Well, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more in the next martini. 
All right, Jim, on to our final martini now. Uh, Republicans would call this good. Uh, others might think it's a little bit crazy just because Nevada has proven to be fool's gold in the last several elections. I think George W. Bush was the last Republican to win a presidential contest in Nevada. It's usually very close. It's been very close in statewide elections as well. The Republicans did win the governorship in 2022, came just short uh, in the Senate. But uh, in the presidential race uh, for Nevada, it's considered a battleground state. And right now, the real clear politics average is Trump plus four and a half. And one of the reasons it's down to four and a half is because there's a new poll out from The Hill and Emerson showing Trump up just one. Bloomberg had him up eight uh, a little less than a month ago. Wall Street Journal had him up four back in the middle of March. And then there's another one from late February, which is probably a little moot at this point. But uh, that would seem to be either right at or outside the margin of error there at at four and a half. And again, uh, the turnout machine, as uh, Harry Reid proved, sadly, (laughs) to us in 2010, is pretty good for the lefties in Nevada. Uh, So there's a lot of work to be done if Trump and other Republicans want to win that year. There's another competitive Senate race there this time around. But, uh, Jim, uh, it looks like the numbers are better for Republicans than even before in Nevada, which is surprising to some. But uh, if they stay that way, especially with RFK Jr. factored in, uh, the Democrats might have one more reason to panic. And it's not like they don't have enough already. Yeah. um, The subheadline in today's morning jolt is, as we say on the Three Martini Lunch podcast, way to go, Nevada, way to go. But this is non-ironic this time. (laughs) <laughs> uh, we'll see how things shake out. And if you're a Republican and you feel like this is Lucy in the football and you feel like you've been here before, I get it. I, I get it. You know, we've seen uh, probably, you know, what spurred us was Sharon Angle just collapsing in, in the, you know, against Harry Reid. The labor unions out in Nevada have a really good get out the vote operation. And Angle was leading in a lot of those final polls. I would say if you're a Democrat and you're within like four maybe even five, probably the get out of the vote operation might be enough to make a difference there. But there are a bunch of these polls that have Trump knocking on the door at t- double digits. Um, the Wall Street Journal poll has him up by four. You'd rather be up by four than by loan. But you got to go back to October to find a poll that has Joe Biden ahead in Nevada. And I think you, you look deeper into these polls, these numbers, Biden's job approval rating is low. P- uh, Nevada's right track, wrong direction numbers are terrible. Um, who do they, you know, what's the most important issue? It's economy and inflation, uh, the economy and immigration by a wide margin. They trust Trump on those two issues by, by a significant margin over Biden. Again, six months from the election, things could change. But if you're, if you've gotten to the idea of, oh, Nevada's a blue state, I don't know if that's a safe bet this cycle. I, and I think Biden is a unique, well, I'm not saying a uniquely weak candidate, but I don't think he's as strong as he used to as he was in 2020. He's not just the alternative to Trump. He has now got a record. People are really unimpressed with that record. People, as I mentioned, really frustrated with the economy, really frustrated with the border. Um, abortion was in there. Some people mentioned it as the top issue in the Bloomberg poll, but that was 7%. Some people mentioned Social Security and Medicare. That was 7% as well, and you know, way behind those other ones. So it's just the stage is set for a Trump victory in Nevada. Not, not guaranteeing it. I'm just saying that right now, in you know, uh, mid mid April to, to early May, looking pretty good for Trump. And it's not the biggest state, but it is one of those classic swing states. I would also say you look at these other swing state polls. I've never believed that North Carolina is a swing state, and there's zero evidence for that. Even though the Biden campaign insists it's one of the seven states that they're putting the most effort in. And frankly, if North Carolina is not flipping. I don't know if Georgia is as dangerous. When I was down there earlier this year, every Republican I was talking to was like, look, really weird set of circumstances last time around. Lousy candidates. Didn't help to have Lynn Wood running around saying the whole election was stolen. We're in a better shape now. Kemp's got the state party running like a well-oiled machine. We're going to be fine. I can't, again, I don't want to guarantee that Georgia is going to be a Republican state, but I think you feel pretty good. Uh, about Trump's chances there. So all of a sudden it comes down to that blue wall that, you know, um, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania really start to look like the election if these three states uh, that, you know, are supposedly swing states don't look all that swingy, at least based on how people are feeling right now. Now, that's a good analysis, and we'll see how things play out. We don't know what the new cycle will bring us. Obviously, we could necessarily have expected uh, the campus insanity, but who knows what else will uh, uh, unfold this summer. Trump's on trial right now. He's potentially going to be on trial again before Election Day. So how folks react to that and potential verdicts, we just don't know. Biden will certainly not get 
better mentally or physically between now and November. That could be to the Republicans' benefit. So a lot of different factors uh, coming into this. But as of right now, you're right that the GOP looks stronger than they usually do at this point in an election cycle. But uh, uh, like you said, even if you're up by a few, history shows us you want to be up by even more. But it's certainly better than being down by a few. Jim, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Thursday and join us again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.